It's recording now. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to our first queer conversation. Uh, we are the SCC Pride Club. Gotta get it right. And um, we were going to do this on campus, but since uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic, we're on Zoom. So, uh, today we are presenting uh, historical LGBT people. Um, so I'll be going first. I have, um, I'm actually only going to do three because I don't know how to pronounce this first one. So I'm going to start with uh, Alan L. Hart. He was born in, in 1890 as Alberta Lucille Hart was an Oregon physician, researcher, and writer, and one of the first trans men to receive a hysterectomy. Wow. Alan, what? Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Allen began presenting as more masculine when he attended Stanford University, and then he graduated from University of Oregon Medical School. Uh, he was attracted to women, and because of this, uh, made an argument for his hysterectomy and to be sterilized, as because uh, you know it was the early 1900s, so that's how they had to do that. Uh, shortly after, he cut his hair and acquired a male wardrobe. He married a school teacher and they moved frequently so that Alan's birth gender wouldn't be revealed. After five years of marriage, they divorced. Uh, Alan received a master's in radiology and became director of radiology and married Edna Reddick. He became an expert on tubercular radiology and later published books that tackled medicine and sexuality. When synthetic male hormones became available after World War II, Hart used them to grow facial hair and deepen his voice. Uh, Alan L. Hart died from heart failure in 1962. Wow. That's what I've got for Alan Hart. Cool. Why did he get divorced? Their marriage just fell apart. Okay. I yeah. think it was a lot of stress to put on a marriage, like having to move that frequently mm -hmm. and stuff. Especially in that time period. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Hi. All right. So, Hannah, do you want to go next? Yeah, I can go next. So, the person I'm talking about is Leslie Feinberg. Um, I'm going to be using um, <clears throat> probably multiple pronouns because for majority of your life, um, Leslie Feinberg used um, Z and here pronouns, but especially towards the end of here life, more used she, her pronouns, and also has been quoted saying, you know, I do have preferred pronouns, but I've had people who hate me and are terrible to me use the right pronouns, and people that are wonderful to me use the wrong pronouns. So, at, like, especially towards the end of her life, um, she didn't really care as long as you respected everything and, like, used the right terms and stuff. So, um, Leslie Feinberg was a stone butch lesbian that um, lived through um, the mid, I think like, uh, what is her birth year? I don't have that in my essay. This is my essay from last quarter. Um, in the like 1950s, 60s, um, where it was really hard to, you know, be gay, especially gender non-conforming, and that's kind of where everything started. So she, um, when she was, I think, 13 or 14, that's when she first started going to gay bars and stuff because her parents were terrible and didn't accept her as being um, gender non-conforming and out. So she, like, she's known for a long time, and she had her first job when she was like 14, and so that's kind of how her life started. started. And she grew on to be just an amazing international um, activist. So she describes herself as um, an anti-racist, white, working class, secular Jewish, transgender, lesbian, female, re revolutionary communist. So a lot, of, a lot of titles there that she had. So there was- It's a mouthful. Yeah, it <laughs> sure is. Um, but throughout her life, she did like so much work. And for, I think, like, actual decades, um, wrote for um, 
a very popular communist um, newspaper. Oh, what was that called? Um, yeah, so the she was an editor for the Workers' World Party newspaper on the political prisoners page for 15 years and later became the managing editor. And um, throughout her time doing that, uh, organized like so many um, rallies and attended a bunch of like pro-labor and anti-war rallies and such and then wrote many books. So the most popular of which um, is Stone Butch Blues and was published worldwide, like hundreds of thousands of copies, multiple different languages. And now um, because she's a communist, it's on her website, lesliefeinberg.net, I think, or just .com. Um, you can go download it for free because she's a communist. She's like, you shouldn't be paying. You can either buy it at price on her website for a hard copy or download it um, for free. And so she just did so much work and she was one of the first people to really talk about um, all of the different intersections of being trans. For like, for a while, basically, it was more understood as trans is just male to female or female to male. And she was just like, no, I'm trans. Yes, I was born a woman and I still identify as a woman, but I am extremely gender non-conforming and that falls under the trans umbrella because she's not a, like what a typical woman would be. And so she definitely made the big distinction between transsexual, transgender um, and stuff. So transsexual would be um, somebody who has gone through the sex change and stuff and then transgender carries non-binary people, carries gender non-conforming people, carries like the, the typical trans people that you would think of. It has that whole umbrella and she started um, many trans rallies and stuff and there was, there was a big um, woman's festival that she ended up kind of protesting and made her own trans camp because it was the kind of woman's thing that only accepted cis women. She's like, ooh, that's not okay. So she made her own. It was just like, this is my trans camp and everybody can come here and be safe. And so she had a wife, Minnie Bruce Pratt, and her first name is Minnie Bruce. And she's also a poet and stuff and has a bunch of things written. She's still alive. Leslie Feinberg died in um, the early or mid, what year was it? um 2014 um because of Lyme disease because throughout her life she's never given proper medical care because she was trans and so she died from a bunch of preventable diseases because she's had those diseases for years and doctors wouldn't treat her correctly because she was trans and like uh, she has multiple articles written about how she was always made fun of in um, doctor's offices by nurses and stuff like calling her name and laughing at like something like somebody being presenting so masculinely having issues with like breasts or uterus or something and she'd get made fun of a lot and never got proper care so take a look at her work it's so incredible um one of the most impactful like a lot of times people are impactful in the US and then nobody else cares because they were just in the US and we tend to be very US centric because we live here, but her work impacted globally. And like a lot of her books and stuff were read by LGBTQ people around the world. She fought for everybody around the world because you know, she, she wasn't just Oh, just some white person in the US. She was Jewish. She was lower class. She was working class. She was anti racist. She went everywhere to prevent wars, to help, like, try to stop wars and stuff. So she's pretty cool. Yeah. Nice. All righty. So, Ren, do you want to present one of yours next? Yeah, I can. All right. So, the first person I have is a lady named Barbara Gittings. I pray I pronounce that word. Um, 
Born July 31st of 1932, sorry, in Austria. Not even gonna try the city. Um, so she moved to America shortly after she was born. And I cannot find the U in my essay. Okay. Um, but she moved to America and she was a big help in the starting of the gay rights movement in America. Um, she helped back a lot of protests and rallies that happened in the 50s and 60s. I... She was also a librarian and so while in America and so she helped with the publishing and with the getting out there of a lot of LGBT books. Um, one of her bigger things she did was in 1972, she was a part of the movement to get the American Psychiatric Association to drop homosexual homosexuality as a mental illness, which later passed in part thanks to her. Is that all you have? Uh, that's all I have for my notes. Okay. Then she died in just 2007 as an equal after being a big influence. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. High school me sucked at taking notes. Okay. Um, I'll do another one and then I'll have Aislinn go. So um, I'm going to skip ahead to my third one. Um, so I have Alan Turing. Uh, many may have heard his name from the movie The Imitation Game, where they portrayed him as kind of a mean dude, but he's at, he was actually a really sweet guy. Uh, he was a British mathematician who led the breaking of the Nazi ciphers in World War II, and he is acknowledged as the founding researcher of computer science and AI. He lived in the early 1900s and proposed the Turing test, which is used for AI and computers. Uh, it's for um, kind of, it's for determining um, whether or not a computer knows that it's a computer. Um, Turing is recognized as one of the most famous victims of homophobia, at least in Britain. Uh, he was discovered in a relationship with a man and was, and was forced to receive chemical castration through injections of synthetic estrogen, and he later died of cyanide poisoning. Most, uh, most people say that it was suicide. Uh, in 2016, British government announced Turing's Law to pardon thousands of gay and bisexual men who were convicted for homosexual acts when it was considered a crime, and in 2019, the Bank of England announced that Turing would appear on the UK's new 50 pound note. So cool. Yeah. And he is awesome. one of the divisions in First Robotics is named after him. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. All right. So I'll have Aislinn go next. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, so I chose Bayard Rustin as my topic for today. Um, because actually just recently he was pardoned in the US. As in uh, February 4th, he was pardoned uh, for, for being gay. <laughs> that, that was his crime. Uh, in 1953, he was, uh, his name was slandered and he was um, pretty much, he was arrested and for the rest of his life, he couldn't get a proper job, stuff like that because it was on his record that he was gay. Uh, he was, for the majority of his life, he was actually a um, civil rights activist. But in the last few years of his life, up to uh, from the early 80s to when he died, he was a gay rights activist. Uh, he actually worked alongside... Um, he worked alongside uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and set up uh, the March on Washington and helped set up the um, 
the bus boycotts in the 60s as well. Um, he was a huge part in the civil rights uh, activist scene in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but because of the slander against him and the fact that he wouldn't um, be ashamed of being gay, he um, was never famous for it. Uh, in fact, even Luther King Jr. Um, would was made sure that he would hide Bayard Rustin because if not, the whole civil rights activist movement would have slander against it because he was gay. And so it was, it was a huge problem that he never got uh, noticed for because he was gay. And he, he actually has a surviving partner that said that although Bayard Rustin was not ashamed of his homosexuality, he was, uh, he knew that he would never be famous and he would often put off gay rights activacy in to focus on civil rights activacy, which he thought was more important at the time. So, yeah, and yeah, he died in 1987. His partner still lives, but uh, it's just now with the 50th anniversary happening last year uh, that he's being recognized again, sadly. He's the one who's in a lot of the pictures right next to Martin Luther King Jr., isn't he? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was his right hand man. Uh, mm -hmm. He set up a lot of things. He was just vital for um, civil rights. It's crazy that, like, even even if not mentioning that he was gay, like in all of my elementary school learning and middle school learning and even high school learning of Martin Luther King, he's literally never mentioned. Yeah, it's crazy. Never learn about him ever. Well, we focus on uh, civil rights advocacy in almost every grade in the U.S., but his name never comes up pretty much. Maybe in newer textbooks, but I mean, we all had the old textbooks from like the 80s and the 90s in school. There, there's no new ones that are in common public schools that state his name. Now, maybe in private schools, but I do know for sure that... Uh, in public schools, you will not hear his name unless your teacher specifically chooses to mention it. And I don't know any teachers that would deviate that far from curriculum. It's so, it's so weird too, because like all of these people that we're talking about obviously are just so impactful, but like you, you don't hear about them. Like even in school, you don't really hear about Alan Turing. Like even though he's incredible, Leslie Feinberg for a lot of things like was really like really prominent like obviously a lot of people hated her as well because she was so out there as being a communist but like led so many so many rallies and stuff that you would think that you would at least hear these names in passing but you never do it is yeah. so bonkers mm -hmm. exactly. e even alan turing i never heard about in mm -hmm. schools until i was in first robotics because he, he is one of the division names, but um, I never knew who he was because uh, nobody uh, w wanted to teach about a gay man, even if he was the founder of computer systems and AI. Yeah, and like, I'm pretty sure the first time, I like, I, I never was in robotics, but I was in a lot of high level um, math and a little bit of high level science and stuff and like my math teacher loved computer stuff and I had a lot of friends who did were in computer classes and stuff and still the only time I really learned about him was the imitation game and that ugh, so and cool. even that doesn't portray him completely correctly no it doesn't the ending I mean his whole chemical castration they just it's in the movie, but they pass over how horrible and painful and disgusting yeah. it was at the time. It's Both one mentally of, and physically. Like, yeah, he, of, he, it was for a year. <sighs> yeah, the fact that he survived for a year is amazing to me because it is one of the worst pains that you can go through. It's comparable to childbirth, which is something coming from somebody who identifies as a woman. Like, that's the worst pain most people can think of. And a lot of scenarios and if, if it's comparable that to that and it's going on for an entire year can you imagine imagine like 
it's awful. That's probably why a lot of people uh, say that his cyanide poisoning was suicide. Yeah. I'm pretty, mm-hmm. does the movie portray it very heavily as suicide? I'm it's not a sure. a long time since they I've seen that. It was suicide, but badly. Okay. Yeah. He was doing he was doing research with cyanide at the time. So okay. so it's possible, but he didn't show any signs of it, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So who's next? Uh let's have Ren do another one. Cool. Cool. Can do. So my next person is Carl M. Bear? Bear? B A E R. It's German, I'm not sure. Um, so he was born in on the 20th of May, 1885, as Martha Bayer, I think. Um, the daughter of a Jewish, of a German Jewish family from not gonna why. Although the <laughs> midwife declared the newborn baby to be a girl, she privately confided to the father that his daughter's body had quote unquote. Okay. Had quote unquote such strange characteristics that had no way of determining the gender. So henceforth, a doctor confirmed Martha to be a girl, and so it was as a girl her parents raised her until 1906. Then, when Martha became the first to undergo sex change surgery. So this this is the guy that you're talking about. Yes, it is. Cool. So, Ren, I'm assuming that implies that he was intersex. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, that's that's what it's that's, looking like in my research. Like. Yeah. Because yeah. it, the... it reminds me of the, the intersex thing that you and I went to, Matt. Mm-hmm. What I was talking about. Anyways. Yeah, because the way they put it in in my notes is such such strange characteristics that she had no way of determining the baby's gender, <gasps> which... <sighs> It does imply intersex. Yeah. That's a weird way of putting it, but yeah, intersex. Um, continuing, child life was very uncomfortable for them as he put... Okay. Child- childhood was very uncomfortable. A quote from him, I was born as a boy and raised as a girl. At puberty, Bayer did not develop a woman's body despite not feeling feminine Bayer became heavily involved in women's rights, perhaps as a direct result of the experience of life as a woman. After studying political political economy and science psychology, there we go. He became a social worker in in a suffrage and joined the international Jewish organization of B'nai B'oth, I think, in 1904. At the same time, he finally began to live as a man, sp- smoking cigars, smoking beer, and acting in masculine ways. About the same time in 1904. Um, then, finally in 1906, Bayer was knocked over by a tw- well, knocked over by a tram, and the me- medical staff in the hospital noted his unusual anatomy. The hospital put the patient put the patient in touch with. I dislike German names put him in touch with a doctor and a sexologist who immediately diagnosed Bear as a man who was mistakenly identified as a woman. The same year, the same, in the same year, in the same hospital, Bayer began, began to have surgery to correct his odd sexual features. The, the, ho- the hospital issued him with a medical certificate confirming his agenda and on January 8th, 1907, a cult ratified Carl Bay's identity as a man. He was married twice, twice some years after, after a post in Bernal Booth, with the help of Hitchfield, he wrote a semi-fictional memoir, a man, a man dears as a young girl. However, with the rise of, of Nazi Germany, his life came to an end, came to an end. In 1937, he was arrested and tortured and then released and allowed to immigrate to Israel in 1938. There, he worked as an accountant and insurance agent, married again, and died in 1956. Wow. Okay, I was better at that point in life. 
So yeah. That's crazy. <sighs> this just goes to show that like people haven't been kind to intersex people at all. No, and, uh, and like just like Matt and I learned in the intersex uh, like seminar, I guess I don't know what to call it. It was a panel. Panel. Okay. Yeah. Um. It's been going on forever. There's no problems. Like, it's very rare that it actually causes problems. Mm -hmm. If it does cause problems, you can get those problems fixed. But other than that, like, intersex people have existed for forever. There's, you just live as a person, and you don't need to be assigned either one. And, yeah... Yeah, if they just had access, if they just had proper medical care, any of the problems that pop up, which the most common one that people say, well, what if they get ovarian or testicular cancers? And it's like, well, everybody's if, at risk for that. Yeah, and if you had proper screening on a regular basis, they are <laughs> they are at a higher risk. <laughs> Finn, but even though they're at a higher risk, it's easy to just do a normal checkup. That's you say, hey, I'm intersex, and they check you just to make sure at every doctor's visit, just like women getting mammograms. Yeah, it's, it's not like, just because you might be at a higher risk for certain things doesn't mean you need to not be treated as a human. Like, if, if just, like, just some random cis woman was at a higher risk for breast cancer because of her genealogy, nobody would treat her like people treat intersex people. It's just... It's just genetics, and it's just a different, like, it's just a different way of development. There's nothing wrong with it, and yeah. uh, it's crazy. It's true. And so many doctors are just not well-versed. Uh, In they, intersex or trans. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And even, even just women's bodies. It should yeah. be something taught in in uh, your school, like, if you're going to become a doctor, it's something that you should learn. And you shouldn't be able to graduate until you've learned about it. Like, it, un it unfortunately makes sense that in that time period, nothing was known because, well, I bet you that some stuff was known, but then, like, in, in other cultures and stuff that um, Europeans um, got rid of. I bet I bet it was known for a while. Just that's just kind of like my guess, but that it still doesn't mean like we need to learn from that. Like we need to have people like this talked about, given to ex as examples to doctors, and be like, you can't do this anymore. But they still do. They still mutilate intersex people's genitalia like on a daily basis. That's very yeah. Mm -hmm. And people just say, well, it'll make them healthier. And the truth is that often it's the opposite, is that maybe physically they're at a lower chance of having problems like cancer, but really they're at a higher chance for mental problems later in life. And um, even then, um, Matt and I learned that the, the physical health actually goes down for a lot of the times when you mutilate them because it, uh, a lot of the times means that they're going to have to be on... Um, different hormones for the rest of their life. It, they're frequently, if you're mutilated at birth, you end up having to have like four or five extra surgeries that you have to pay for when you didn't even ask for the mutilation in the begin, in like to begin with. Mm -hmm. it because, because it can't grow normally mm -hmm. because of the first surgery. Yeah. Oh, it's, so it, it's in my opinion that any unnecessary surgeries performed on babies should be illegal. This includes yeah. ear piercings and stuff like that too, which is of course controversial, but um, it includes a lot of things, uh, but babies can't make their own choices. Um, if in the future they decide to have a surgery because it's interfering with their social life, which is always at a risk because kids be mean sometimes, um, then they can make that choice with their parents' consent. But parents should not be able to choose the gender of their child. Um, it's you just know, should doctors that don't even ask the parents sometimes. Yep, exactly. They just say, well, it was going to be a problem. And most parents aren't well-versed enough in medical uh, terminology to understand that it's actually not 
um, the and even if, even if they are asked, um, it's like your child was just born. It's a stressful situation, and the yeah. doctor presents it as urgent. So it's even kind if of it's this just whole panic surgery. Yeah, it's, it's all cosmetic. It's doesn't it doesn't help the function. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have more a higher chance of hurting a baby when performing surgery in the first few days of its life. Uh, then you have helping it. Now, there, there are plenty of scenarios where surgery is necessary, but not when it comes to gen. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have, so I have two more people to present. I think Who Joy and, I think Joy has one and Ren has one more. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna do the one for the name I can't pronounce, and then okay. I'll save the funny one for last. Uh, to kind of lift up this whole thing. So, okay, so Google Translate tells me her last name is pronounced Dion. So uh, her name is Chevalier Dion. Uh, she lived in the late 1700s as a trans woman in France. I'm going to show you a picture real quick. That's really early to be out as mm -hmm. trans. That's so cool. Yeah. And here she is after transitioning. I love her. That's and then she's got a big hat. She looks yeah. Like a kindly grandma. She does. God, I wish that was my grandma. <laughs> uh, through uh, royal familial relations, she became secretary to the French ambassador to Russia and also a spy aiming to put her cousin on the Polish throne. Incredible. Uh, <laughs> Chevalier. Uh, Dion was knighted at 35, but almost immediately after was fired from secretary for importing too much expensive wine and was facing punishment, so she hid out in Britain. When, uh, when her father died and Louis XVI was appointed to king, he no longer needed Dion as a spy, so he had her return to France and um, when she returned to France, she used the narrative that she had been born female but was forced into the role of son by her father, the king, so that um, she would be able to be raised to be the successor. Um, so uh, upon her return to France, she transitioned to be legally recognized as a woman, but upon receiving this recognition, she faced sexism and political silencing because she was a woman. We can't win. Wow. Nope. Uh. Yep. It's rough. All righty. So, Joy, do you want to go next? Yeah, I can go next. So, the guy that I have, uh, I learned about in my art, one of my art history classes, and uh, decided to research more on because uh, I feel like a lot of people are mean to him. Uh, his name is Felix Gonzalez Torres. He is a Cuban born American and he was born. I can't remember the year he was born, but he died in 1996, so he isn't alive anymore. But he is an artist. He worked primarily in New York and, uh, and such and started doing his art because he was a gay man who. Or, and I have, sorry, I have my sorry. notes pulled up on my phone. I was going to try to find his art. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. You yeah, because you, you can screen share. Oh, okay. I didn't yeah. Know. You can find some of his art. But he actually, he worked in the New York University for a while and also in the California Institute, Institute of the Arts. But most of his art was sculpture based and he actually joined and co-founded, I think, an organization that um, was focused on educating the public and so most of his art was actually centered around some uh, like symbolic sculpture about how AIDS can affect uh, relationships and society. So some of his most known work is uh, that he had very interactive exhibits, which were piles of candy. And the piles of candy were in the exact way of his uh, lover, who was named Ross. And he died of AIDS uh, before uh, Felix did. So that was, uh, it really scared yeah. Felix. So he, so he made these piles of candy uh, 
that were in the same weight of his lover before AIDS started to take away his weight. So it was symbolic of people taking the candy away and that was symbolic of how AIDS took away at his health over time. But he has a lot of um, other sculpture that also relate to Stonewall because he documented um, things from Stonewall, I believe. And he has more interactive things with which were piles of photos of Stonewall and people could take um, prints as they go away. Um, and as they go away, the pile diminishes or something, but he would uh, make sculptures on the anniversaries of Stonewall. But a lot of people don't see his work as valid artwork because it's just stuff. It's just candy. It's just stuff and it's just candy. But all of his work was symbolic and you have to know the history behind it in order to interpret it as artwork. And one of his most, or one of his most famous pieces are two clocks that are on the wall side by side. And it's called um, True Lovers. And so he sets them to the same time. And uh, as time goes on, the clocks will eventually go out of sync and one of the clocks dies. And then the other clock dies. And he said that was a very symbolic piece for him because it was, it obviously symbolizes how life ends eventually. And he said that doing that piece was one of the scariest things he ever did because he had to confront the fact that he would eventually pass as his lover did. But he wanted to immortalize that love that he had for his partner. So he has a lot of very moving pieces if you take the time to like read um, like the history about them and what they symbolize. But yeah, I think he's a very important figure uh, to think about in the arts field. But yeah. Wasn't it just the other day that we saw like a meme on an LGBT page? Yeah, and was... there was, I saw a meme a couple of days ago on an LGBT page making fun of his artwork. And it made me a little bit upset because, um, she was this yeah. close to rage commenting and be like, if you rage. go look up what his art means, you'll cry and shut up. Yeah, but he uh, he passed at the age of 38 uh, due to AIDS as well. Yeah, he was, he was, he was pretty young. Yeah, AIDS took a lot of lives, especially um, when they were still young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why he was so adamant about uh, trying to educate the public on it. And so that's why all of his artwork is centered around AIDS and how it affects people. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, someone else <laughs> lighten the mood, please. Okay, Ren's next. And then I Whoa. have... And then I have a funny one to finish us off. Okay, good. Cool. That was a dark note to lead in there. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> it's important. The dark yeah. stuff is important. It is. But it's yeah. It is. It's very important. I I just hate how we went from talking about candy to talking about AIDS. How AIDS sucks. Yeah. Uh, okay, so mine is less of a person and more of talking about how the two binary gender system is a recent thing and how oh hello dog there are there have been non binary genders across the world across this way so I'm just going to have a little bit of history on that because I couldn't find any one specific non-binary person to talk about and it made me very upset okay so um, just, like, a few random ones I have. Um, so the modern of gender binary is only a recent thing that developed pretty recently. I want to say within the last 200 years. My dog is paying full attention now. Um, but throughout history, they have always been more than just two and binary. In, in Indonesia specifically, there were, there are five recognized genders and have been for a very long time. In India, there was at least four that are recognized and used, that are recognized and used as genders and things to go by and different things you do instead of just male female there's 
there's even a third gender listed as far back as the Ottoman Empire, which mm -hmm. is interesting to note. Um, these people refer to as the Koek, K-O-C-E-K, that's how it's spelled, I suck at pronouncing. Um, oftentimes they presented more femininely, but they weren't stereotypically feminine. Um, they were they presented feminine, but still identified as a third gender, and so that is how they were presented. Mexico, Native America, Indonesia, Hawaii, literally everywhere. Thank you, man. Yeah. So, just non binary has existed forever, and I couldn't find one specific person to talk about. So, there you go. That's my spiel for the day. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I love the umbrella. Um, I love that umbrella picture because whenever you try to talk to some people about, hello, about gender and transgenderism, they're just like, no, you have to be male or female. And when it's an umbrella with umbrellas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, there's so many things, like I won't go into too much detail this panel, but um, another time, but like, even things like within within the community, like I was saying that Leslie Feinberg identified as trans, even though that she still also identified as a woman. That's very common with a lot of lesbians is that you identify as a woman still, but you're not necessarily cis because mm -hmm. it just adds this whole other, other layer. Like most lesbians don't actually identify as non-women from from a lot of the people that I've talked to, including myself, your identity as a woman kind of comes down to I'm a woman and I'm connected to womanhood because of my love for other women and stuff. And so like binaries and stuff just scientists have said for years now, they're like, oh, gender's actually pretty much up here. Like They've been saying that for years. So everybody who's like, science is on our side, that science says there's binary. It's like, if you would just read a little bit, you would know that it's not. And there are like, sometimes using historical examples can be problematic because like, sometimes things were classified as gay or like a, a third gender, but still weren't treated well. It's still important to remember, obviously. But like, I know that um, like some Greek things when Greek and Roman things were, where people were gay, it was actually more of a dominance thing. And there was still a lot of um, misogyny that people didn't really care if men were gay, but lesbians were big bad. And, like nobody liked lesbians and stuff. And, but like things still have been around for literally ever. It's not a new thing. It's, it's a thing that was covered up when the Catholic church burned everything <laughs> well it's also not exclusive to humans because there's exactly. a, there's at least 1500 other species that demonstrate homosexuality and uh being trans of in some way also we gave animals gender you can't tell me that my cat licking plastic has any concept of <laughs> no they don't know what gender it is <laughs> so like like, even with, like, bees, what, they have technically, they have three different genders, and it's, like, the worker bees, the queen, and the other one, but we label them all as, like, all female or, female or anything, because our tiny brains are, like, Phew. it's, like, they're animals, they don't care, they're just existing, living their lives, we were the ones that put binary on everything, and, and some animals will just up and switch genders because they, they've run out in whatever group they're in, like clownfish. And frogs. And stuff like that. Not all frogs, I think, but some. Oh, no, not all frogs. Speaking of which, I have some points to tell you guys about Nemo after this is done. Okay, well, before that, I have 
one more person to present. Um, so, uh, Harry Allen was a trans man in the eighteen oh, yeah. in the late eighteen hundreds. He lived in Seattle, which, so that that's pretty cool to me because I'm from uh, near Seattle. Me too. Um, but uh, so a lot of this, I'm going to be referring to him as she and her dead name because um, I'm going to be reading exact uh, snippets from the newspapers that <laughs> he was shown in. I remember you telling me about this one. <laughs> yeah. So um, Harry Allen was known for his chaotic rejection of his female birth assignment and often showed up in newspapers. Um, the press constantly misgendered him and he would call them out on it. And that was before misgendering was a well-known term. And girls often fell in love with him. But since Harry was not recognized as a man legally, he could not be charged for the seduction of these ladies. But he wouldn't be with them. So at least, th at least three women uh, were reported to have attempted suicide because they were in love with him. And he wasn't in love with them back. And it was so dramatic. Oh my god. <laughs> like, oh, he's not in love with me. Guess I'll die. <laughs> yeah. And then he died of syphilitic meningitis in 1922. He was banging. <laughs> Some of the newspaper articles read as follows. Uh, the girl refuses to wear skirts. Nellie Pickerell acts, talks, and dresses like a man and says she ought to have been one. So that's pretty, that's pretty, uh, indicative of her being trans him being trans and then um nell pickerell in Kurt court her trial for throwing a spittoon at a saloon man is continued <laughs> <laughs> uh girl tries to end her life pearl waldron falls in love with notorious nell pickerell uh and that one of them just reads nell pickerell again that's it <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and then another one, very similarly, uh, the notorious Nell Pickerell in town. Jeez. <laughs> and then shortly following, Nell Pickerell again in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Not so again. very chaotic. Uh, I'm just trying to get some. I, who can blame? <laughs> yeah. Um, Ladies Nell are pretty. Yeah. Nell Pickerell attended bar in Montana town. Seattle woman appears in men's clothes because she says her features make it possible. <laughs> and then um, the last one that Goodness. the last one that isn't a real downer. Uh, trousered woman bites policeman. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Finally. After that, after that, she got stabbed by her father. So. Oh, that's rough. Yeah, and then Yikes. later died. So. Lived her, he, he lived his life, though. Yeah, he, he lived his chaotic life. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. An icon. Mm-hmm. So, that's um, what I've got. <laughs> yeah. Um, since, so, talking about famous LGBT people, can we talk a little about, I, I don't, I know that at least Matt hasn't seen it. I want to talk a little bit about um, Tiger King. I know everybody's talking about it right now, but in the way of like inappropriately showing. Oh, I haven't seen it, but I've heard, but I've seen articles about what you're talking about. Okay, yeah, there's, yeah. So one of the character, not characters, one of the people, Saf, um, is a trans guy. And I actually did look up some of his stuff and he's not. He said personally, he's not mad about the documentary because he's solid in his gender. And he's like, literally, since I can remember, I've gone by he, I've gone by Saf. He was in the military too for a while and went by Saf. And I don't know if he was actually allowed to be in the military. I, I don't know that. But um, he said that he always went by he and like all of his coworkers called him that. So he doesn't know why in the documentary that they didn't do that, but he he also isn't mad about the people <laughs> and being like, hey, that's not cool. You misgendered this guy throughout the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So and like, It was purposeful misgendering, too. Yeah. Because, yeah. so I was really confused at the beginning mm -hmm. with that because um, 
all the people in the park would say he, and then the voiceover would be like, she, and I'd be like, are they talking about the same person? What's going on? Like, so it wasn't even like they did it so that people wouldn't get confused or some like bull excuse like that. Yeah. They did it on purpose and it was extra confusing. <laughs> yeah. And even That's like funky. in some of the little like interviews that they like cut to with people, when the people in the situation, they would kind of like stumble over, they would pause before they said she, kind of like they were expected to say she, even though they had called him he their entire time knowing him. Like, because I know that some of the people in the interviews did say she instead of he. But like, that's just, it, it's, it's so weird to me that we have like this really famous polyamorous gay man who is not a good person shown so in, in, in this light but then there's a trans person right next to him and he's not recognized mm -hmm. and even then like yeah it's just it's so weird because we're still in history like we're still making history and we're still treating people badly we're still treating trans people different from other other people and like right next to it like i I feel like that show did not do a good job of what it was supposed to do because it didn't focus on the animals. It only focused on um, Joe's gayness. It didn't focus on anybody else's. It completely erased the concept of bisexuality, like completely. Like all of his husbands and stuff, they're just like, oh yeah, they were straight. It's like, even though they were being manipulated by Joe, they still did fall in love with him, they said, like, at the beginning, and they did kiss him and do all of these things, even if it's 90-10, say bye, like, they, they just completely erase it. They used gayness as a way to make their um, show famous, and they made sure, uh, the people who made the documentary are, in my opinion, even if they don't think so, they are homophobic. Um, because they, the only time that they used somebody being gay or being trans or being part of the LGBT community at all was to show how bad they were. Yeah. Because um, they only used Joe Exotic. And on another level, polyamory can be considered, some people consider it part of the LGBT community. Some people don't. I don't want to start that conversation. But there are a lot of people in healthy relationships as well. And this one showed every single way to have an unhealthy relationship, not just with Joe, but with the other guy who owns the tiger place. Yeah, they called it polyamory when really it wasn't polyamory. It was men manipulating a harem. That yeah. was. Yeah, they called it polyamory, but it was obviously not to anybody who is in the community. And I'm not, but I know a lot of people who are, and they yeah. all... They're like, this is not the way it is. And if it is this way, that's just abuse. There yeah. is a difference between polyamory and abuse. And it's a very big difference. It's not even like a gray area. No. It's black and white. Yeah. And like, you could even see the, the abuse in Joe and his first husband where like, Joe was like, hey, after like a week of the new 19 year old being there, be like, hey, can we marry this guy too? And his husband was obviously very like, uh, I mean, I guess it's a, if it's what you want. Like, if both partners aren't open to it, it's a no. Like, that's it. It's it's no. Or you break up. And it's it's one of those things where, like, he obviously did it to make his hu husband happy. And yeah. that's not the way relationships should be in any way. So if anybody watching this is in a polyamorous relationship and your partner is acting like that, please reach out for help because that's abuse. Um, I, I'm not here to argue that because it, it is, it's black, it is. I said. Um, and so is the, the other guy with like the 10 different wives, like that's abuse, he's manipulated, all of the wives on that show is just like, oh yeah, no, he manipulated us, we hated him, but we had to have sex with him if he wanted us to, if, if, if he wanted to get paid, yeah, any, re any livable wage, because yeah. he was paying the bare minimum technically by giving them room and board, yeah. but it, to actually have a livable wage, you had to sleep with him, and that is manipulation and abuse. Um, nobody should have to live through that. Um, it, it, it's not really that consensual, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because we're talking about famous people, and that's just been a really big thing, and Joy and I 
watched it were like, why is everybody obsessed with this? It's, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think any of the characters besides Saf are like good people. Like, there were a couple of the weird. side guys who actually cared about the tigers. Yeah. I do appreciate that. Um, and I'm glad that I hear all the tigers have been rehomed, all mm -hmm. the been rehomed at this point, and that's, that's very good, and I'm glad. Um, and this did much more harm than good. It did harm to the LGBT community. It did harm to the community of people who own very ethical and well-run zoos and places to have exotic animals because those animals cannot be released into the wild. We all know that. Uh, it also did harm to working class people because it showed all working class people as druggies out for money. Yeah. Like, all of them. Mm -hmm. I think besides Saf, every single, like, because Joe only hired, like, working class, low class people and manipulated them. And he, like, it, it just did harm to all of the communities it represented. And honestly, on, on top of that, um, he was hiring a lot of people out of prison off of the streets, and that's amazingly commendable. And like they said, when this interview, because this took place, this whole documentary took place over multiple years. Mm -hmm. And he started out as an amazing person, but once he got touched with that fame, he was yeah. not good anymore. And um, a lot of people said stuff to that effect that like he was really good, but then he became awful because of the fame. And, and then I think this documentary just gave him more fame, like. Yeah, and now people are going to be more afraid to be around LGBT people, yep. LGBTQ plus people. Um, they're gonna be more afraid to be around people that are just out of prison. They're gonna be more afraid to go to zoos. They're gonna be more afraid to uh, search for other ways to be in relationships, like going into polyamory or an open relationship, which can be helpful for some people, like. Yeah. It, to you but they're going to be afraid to touch on these communities or even like think about them because of an interview like this and it just goes to show that um, some documentaries can do a lot more harm than good because although it is the truth there are some truths that don't need to be put in the limelight yeah and you can also kind of recognize those truths as truths that aren't everything or it's not the whole truth yeah, but yeah, I just I just thought that was something important since we're talking about famous things and that's the most famous thing right now. And we've come a long way, but we still haven't yeah. gone far. Um, something like that can be published by something like Netflix. And a bunch of people thinking. obsessed over it. Like a bunch of people wow. in the community obsessed with it. Well, yeah, and it's, it's the fact that that is even um, an option at this point just shows that we so far to go still. We have come a long way, but there is still places to go. A lot of people recently have been saying, well, gay people have the same rights as straight people and everything is equal. And well, what about transgender people? They, they don't have the same rights as everyone else. What about any other marginalized community other than, you know, cis gay men? Yeah, um, literally which I mean, they've done so much for our community and I'm so glad and they're so supporting other minorities. Um, but they're, they're often what people see as the entire community. And when a show like this comes out, it just sets us back so far because that is a cis gay man doing horrible things. Yeah, cool. Because I don't want to end on a super depressing note, um, because <laughs> God, that went far. Um, yeah, we do have a long ways to go, and speaking as a non-binary person, especially with non-gender conforming, there's a long way to go, and I would just like to bring up the fact that almost all of the research I did in the last couple of days that when I was looking for specific non-binary people to talk about was just like the recent people, like people born in the 70s and onwards. Like, yes, there's a lot of very notable, very good and influential people that were on those lists. People like Jonathan Van Ness and Sam Smith and yeah. etc. I love Jonathan Van Ness. Absolutely. Love them. Um, but 
it just goes to show that the erasure of LGBTQ plus history has been such a big thing. And if I mute myself in one second, I'm sorry. It just goes to show how bad it is and how far we have to go. But it also shows the fact that we do have so many LGBTQ plus people in mainstream media that are trying to fight for it is also something that I genuinely love. Yeah. Like, apparently Miley Cyrus came out as law binary some time ago. Oh, I, didn't I didn't hear about that. this. I didn't I hear knew, about that. I knew that even if she didn't say it, I'm pretty so, sure I. She didn't say specifically, like, I am non-binary, but mm-hmm. in recent interviews, she has expressed her discomfort with gender conformity. Cool. Um, if I can find it, I'll send you guys articles. But, awesome. yeah, I found that when I was researching today, which was really weird and Invisible. really it's weird to think about how some things just don't get shown. Yeah, there's definitely still a lot of erasure in our community. Um, some portions of our community are more privileged than others. It happens on a slope. I mean, it starts out with the most common and it goes to the least common. And mm-hmm. people, we're, we're making great progress, but we still have ways to go. And hopefully, eventually, we'll have textbooks that include LGBTQ plus history and include all these people that made huge strides for science and history and mathematics. Every single section of our culture has been influenced by an LGBTQ plus person at one point or another, um, whether it was 100 years ago or 10 days ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. And that's why it's important that we continue talking like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna keep doing this, correct? Yes. Yeah. So do we wanna say what the topic is gonna be for next week? If anybody watches this and wants to stay tuned? Oh, we don't know the topic for yeah, next we week yet. <laughs> We've that. thrown Didn't a lot of ideas, but we don't have anything set on some. Yeah. <laughs> you know we'll attempt to make a post on uh follow us online, uh Hannah do you know on Instagram? Yeah, I'm going to, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this link once um, Matt gets, I figured you're going to do it because I don't do anything. Um, I'm going to post it on the Bigfoot app and then I'm going to post it on the Pride at SCC Instagram. And then I'm also going to post it on my personal Instagram because I know that a lot of people that are in the club or like know about the club because I want this, I I don't think there'd be a problem with this reaching people outside of SCC. No, there isn't. Yeah. Um, we're also posted on YouTube. So right now I do want to say that our handle is just Pride SCC, uh, no caps. So that's where it should be posted. Cool. Uh, we also have a Facebook account, which I think is also Pride at SCC. Yeah, I still don't have access to that. Yeah, we'll get access to it eventually. Okay. Or we'll make a new one. Cool. Um, but if you're coming from uh, from YouTube, please follow us at Pride SEC. Um, our name on it is Pride Club at SEC, but our handle is Pride SEC. Um, so yeah, cool. All right, thank you for watching, and thank you to my fellow club members for meeting. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. All right. See you next week. See yeah. you next week. Thanks, guys.